Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone to the space webinar. So uh, our speaker for today is Doc, uh, Professor Ivan Dokmanich uh, from University of Basel. And his talk is on learning the geometry of wave-based imaging. Um, so let me do a short introduction of, uh, uh, of Ivan. So he is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at the University of Basel, Switzerland. Um, so from 2016 to 2019, uh, he was an assistant professor in the Coordinate Science Lab uh, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he now holds an adjunct uh, position. Uh, he received his PhD in computer science from EPFL in 2015 and did a postdoc in Institute uh, Langevin and ENS in Paris between uh, 2015 and 2016. Uh, his research interests lie between inverse problems, machine learning, and signal processing. Uh, so he received uh, multiple awards, um, uh, including Google PhD Fellowship uh, and EPFL Outstanding Doctoral Thesis Award and a Google Faculty Research Award. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Doc Manich. Thanks, Jane, uh, for the introduction. Um, and thanks to all the organizers for running this uh, terrific uh, talk series that I'm uh, honored to you know, uh, be part of. Um, so today I'd like to discuss some thoughts and results on using machine learning and in particular deep neural networks to address inverse problems in wave-based imaging, wave-based inverse problems. And I'd like to do it in a way that I believe is, is quite natural and it also gives, gives good results. Uh, this is joint work, the stuff that I'll describe is joint work with my student from UIC, Connie Kotari, and Martin De Hoop from Rice University. Wave imaging or wave-based problems are, are definitely some of the most important and practically relevant problems in imaging. And uh, examples that are particularly pertinent to this talk are, for instance, seismic imaging, where um, we're trying to say something about the structure of the subsurface from uh, measurements of scattered waves uh, by sensors on the surface, as well as biomedical imaging, things like ultrasound tomography uh, for breast cancer screening, or emerging modalities like photoacoustic tomography. And the leitmotif of, of the talk today will be this dichotomy between sort of convolutional and non-convolutional physics. Somehow when, uh, when the waves will be traveling over homogeneous medium, uh, then everything will be nice and in a certain sense convolutional and standard architectures will do extremely well. Uh, but when the, the medium that the waves are propagating over uh, becomes more complicated, then rays start bending and uh, things stop being convolutional. And so I'll be asking whether there are better architectures to work with this non-convolutional geometry. Now, you know, a standard way or <laughs> to start to talk about wave imaging is by the wave equation, which is indeed uh, the, the queen or the empress of, uh, you know, it's, it's really behind all... Um, all, all, all sorts of wave phenomena. Here I'm showing a simple scalar acoustic wave equation for, for the scalar wave field U. That's a function of space and time, but of course you can complicate it as much as you want. Uh, so it's, it's a second order linear PDE, which relates the second derivative in time to uh, <clears throat> the second derivatives in space. And it has certain components that I'll now take the opportunity to, to introduce. So the main object of interest typically, which characterizes the medium is the wave speed here. The wave speed is a function of space, and it's really an image that we're trying to recover because it tells us about the structure, let's say, of the subsurface uh, or of, a, of an organ of tissues. And uh, the way we can access this wave speed is through the wave field U. So waves propagate over this background wave speed, and they generate a wave field U, which we can typically sense uh, using sensors at the boundary of the domain most, most often. And the map from, from this wave speed to these measurements is the forward map, which I'll variously denote by F or A. Um, our reverse problem or the imaging problem is then going back, trying to invert this forward map. So going from these measurements to, let's say, this distribution of wave speed uh, in the seismic case or uh, in the biomedical case. Uh, maybe as a parenthesis, you know, in biomedical imaging, you often also want to recover the density parameter, which I'm not showing here, but it's uh, completely straightforward to introduce it. And the third 
the important ingredient of the wave equation is the source term, the right hand side, which, you know, in biomedical imaging, let's say in breast tomography, those could be pulses that are emitted by the transducers that are placed around the breast, or in the seismic case, those could be earthquakes, um, or maybe seismic noise or man-made man -made sources. And traditionally, you know, people have been solving uh, wave-based in response for a long, long, long time. So, so of course, there's a, there's a host of traditional approaches. Uh, so I'll just do a very, very coarse overview and division, which is important for this talk without attempting to do justice to like the enormous <laughs> breadth of the field. Uh, one group of methods is called or related to full waveform inversion. And this is really what we in signal processing or, or imaging always, um, always think about when you're trying to solve an inverse problem. So basically we have the forward operator, which takes this unknown wave speed, maps it to the measurements Y, and we concoct some, some loss, some uh, objective that tells us how, how good this current guess for the wave speed uh, matches the measurements, the observed, uh, the observed measurements. And then you know you, you iteratively update this wave speed. So maybe you compute the gradient of the loss with respect to the wave speed, you update it and you iterate until convergence. Um, now this, of course, if you could solve it efficiently, this would be exactly what you want to do. This would be the best method. But the trouble is that, uh, first of all, it's slow because computing the gradients require you to solve the wave equation forward and then backward in time to compute the adjoint of the derivative. And also, um, you know, the loss is extremely non-convex because let's say if you have high frequency waves, then uh, most of the traditional losses become extremely oscillatory because high frequency waves are oscillatory. And this leads to things like cycle skipping that people in the community are familiar with. And then there's a, a host of geometric approximations, which are based on, on high frequency approximations of waves and, and thinking in terms of rays and so forth. And these then lead to certain tomographic um, imaging modalities where you can relate the measurements to integrals of some property like the slowness, the inverse of the wave speed uh, along certain characteristic curves. Um, and so, so somehow these are the two big group of methods. Of course, when, when we solve inverse problems today, we often think about the new traditional and the new traditional is, um, is to use deep learning. And so again, without attempting to you know, um, give a substantial overview, which is uh, essentially impossible, uh, I'll just give a, a coarse division of the, of the possible approaches that is again, somehow relevant for the talk. So you could use two different groups of approaches that involve learning. One is the approaches that use the forward operator and then the approaches that don't. And among those that use the forward operator, um, there's again, you know, an enormity of approaches, but uh, one one class of, of, of methods is uh, similar to, to something that's called physics-informed neural networks that came out of the group of uh, Karniadakis. And the idea is that you reparameterize your unknown, in this case, the wave speed, using a neural network, and then you can take the derivatives, uh, spatial and temporal of this neural network, and you can again close it in some sort of a energy minimization loop and uh, do something similar to full waveform inversion. Is benefits from the inductive biases of neural networks in representing unknowns, uh, but it also suffers from many of the problems that full waveform inversion techniques suffer. And it's not really learning, it's more like differentiable programming because you're not learning it enough. And another strategy is taking an algorithm that you use to optimize an energy, like primal dual or ADMM, you, you unroll this algorithm for a couple of iterations, and then you learn parts, uh, parts of this unrolled algorithm. And again, there's like a huge number of papers that have been written this works very well. Uh, it's in a sense also physics based because it's using the forward operator. But one drawback is that when you train these architectures and also when you deploy them, you again need to actually um, apply the forward operator and its adjoint repeatedly, which uh, is something that hopefully we can somehow avoid. Uh, this definitely avoided with architectures that don't use the forward operator. And again, I gave like a very short list, uh, a very non-complete list, but certainly the most famous one is the unit. Uh, which works well uh, for an astounding number of inverse problems. Maybe it doesn't give the state of the art performance in any of them, but almost gets there in many. And then there are architectures, for example, that uh, came out from the group of Le Xing Ying that are going in the direction of, of being tuned to certain problems um, related to physics, to partial differential equations, but are still very general. And they're based um, on these non standard uh, Belkin, Koifman, Racklin uh, wavelet representations. But certainly among 
you know, all of these architectures, unit is, you know, the king or the queen or the empress, whatever you want. I mean, it's really incredible and, and almost annoying how well it works on, on a huge number of your response. Uh, so in this talk, the material that I present uh, is going to be something different from, from these two extreme approaches. It's going to be maybe somewhere in between. But we certainly want to be physics driven because you know, accounting for the physics improves generalization and sometimes dramatically, especially out of training distribution. But we don't want to just reparameterize, let's say the wave speed by a neural network and then optimize some loss because then we're not learning anything. We're not learning a reconstruction map. Um, and we also refrain from the unrolling approaches because we don't want to repeatedly uh, solve the full wave equation backwards and forward in time. Um, we somehow don't want to use the full wave equation at all. This is, of course, a natural way maybe to think about waves because when you, when you, uh, when you ask you know, someone to intuitively describe wave propagation, nobody will say, oh, you know, like the intuition behind waves is you know, the second derivative in time uh, equals the Laplacian of the wave field uh, or something like that. People will talk about wave fronts and rays and things that are traveling somewhere. And this intuition is good because it's how you know, the giants um, and the physicists and the mathematicians of the past thought about it. And the two examples are Christian Huygens with uh, wave fronts that regenerate themselves and then generate a wave field. And in a dual uh, picture, Pierre de Fermat, who um, thought it in terms of rays, so light traveling between two points in a way that minimizes the time or the optical path length that takes to travel between these two points. Right? And the good thing is, uh, well, then that we ask what kind of architectures are good for moving wave fronts around, because that's the way that's the way we want to think. You know, more mechanistic, more cartoonish way to think about waves. So the good news is that this cartoonish representation can be made formal uh, using a mathematical framework of Fourier integral operators, and that's the route that we take. Now, as a short outline, I want to spend quite a bit of time trying to convey my intuition for for this type of problems. Uh, so how can we generalize convolutions to, to something more powerful and then build neural networks on top of it that turn out to work well. To do that, we'll have to change also the loss. We'll have to think about why MSC is not a great loss for waves. And then I'll show you how this gives an architecture that generalizes extremely well. And it's also interpretable in a way that traditional physics driven architectures maybe are not. Um, yeah, we can judge later. Maybe a good way to start is um, with convolutions. Um, so as I said, you know, this unit that I, I, I guess it doesn't need special introduction because it's been cited 25,000 times by now. So I guess it's even known to people who study Marxism and dialectics or stuff like that. But it works extremely well for an enormous amount of humorous problems. And so one possible intuition, which doesn't necessarily explain everything, but gives, gives a start is for, for why it works so well is, is as follows. And this has been put forward in one of the earliest uh, papers that used uh, the unit to solve um, computer tomography. So let's say that you, know, you start with an object that you're trying to image. Uh, and then your measurements when you're doing computer tomography are defined by the Rodan transform, so forward operator f, which takes these objects, you know, computes integrals along lines, and somehow neatly arranges them in, in something that we call the sinogram. Now, there's nothing convolutional uh, in the relationship between the sinogram and the original object that you're trying to reconstruct. However, if you hit the sinogram with the adjoint of the Radon transform, then what you get is really a blurred version of the phantom that you started with. Now, this is, of course, well known and not too hard to show. It's, in fact, easy to see that the composition of the adjoint of f and f is a convolution, or at least a filtering, a Fourier multiplier. Since this is the case, well, then to the first approximation, solving the Inris problem corresponds to a deconvolution. Right? It's still some sort of a filter. And so it seems that using an architecture that somehow can implement you know, this translation invariant things, filtering, is a good idea. Of course, it doesn't explain everything, but it's a start. Uh, now, of course, when I say that it doesn't explain everything, it doesn't explain a lot of it. Because for example, it's well known today that uh, convolutional neural networks that involve downsampling and nonlinearities are not even uh, shift invariant. I mean, there are these famous examples that you shift an image by a pixel and uh, convolutional neural network mix classifies it. So it's definitely not shift invariant. And there have been recent attempts to, to mend this by using anti-aliasing and other single processing techniques, which also don't make them shift invariant because of um, non-linearities. Actually, we recently came up with a simple method that makes these networks 
uh, perfectly shift invariant. However, this is a little bit besides the point because whether or not they're shift invariant, they still work on a number of inverse problems that, that is you know, just astounding. This doesn't really change their applicability. Uh, so this is just a parenthesis. Um, certainly these things don't explain the fact that units seem to be able to invert XOR encryption. So this is the result from a, a very cute uh, paper by Hauptmann and Adler, uh, who apply a unit to inverting a certain XOR encryption with a couple of caveats, uh, and the unit succeeds in this. And the, the message that they have, meta message in the paper, and that I completely agree with, and I've been preaching it for, for a while, is that training a simple CNN, in particular the unit, um, should always be used as a baseline in any in any proposed for any proposed new method, right? especially if the method is learning first, because it's just so darn good. It's, it's impossible. It's uh, it's annoying. Right. So let's see how it works for weight problems then. I mean, maybe we don't need to look look beyond the unit for weight problems either. I'll be coming back to this particular example later in the talk. So for the moment, I'll just briefly describe what this problem is about. We have a a, a certain initial pressure distribution, which is described by these little rectangles. And this initial pressure distribution is propagating over some non-homogeneous background, which is not shown here, but it means that rays are not straight. And it gives you some final wave field at, at some later time. And so the inverse problem here that we're trying to solve is a simple one. We just try to do reverse time continuation. So we try to go from the final snapshot of the wave field to the original uh, initial source distribution. So we can train the unit with a whole bunch of initial pressure distributions like this one and apply it then to, to this test example. And we see that it does pretty well. So indeed, <laughs> uh, although there is nothing convolutional about this problem, um, the unit does well. By the way, I mean, in this case, we pretend that we don't know the background wave speed. So we don't know the other joint. We cannot make this problem convolutional by hitting it with an adjoint. Now, let's try to apply this trained unit to uh, an example that looks similar to this initial pressure distribution, but it's just slightly different. Right? It has a circle there. Well, in this case, the unit starts falling apart in ways that are, that are actually quite amusing. I mean, it really starts to paint these little things that he has seen in the training set over this circle, and it completely messes up things there. So it's fair to say that in this case, the unit doesn't really learn anything about wave propagation. Right? Or in other words, just because it solves the problem for the training distribution, it doesn't mean that the learned operator, the learned map, is particularly good and meaningful, depending on your definition of these terms. In fact, here it seems that the unit acts a little bit like the dictionary. Um, it decomposes the input in things that are familiar and then tries to, um, tries to assemble the output out of them. This intuition can be taken pretty far, actually, because you can build an ordinary linear dictionary that has a structure of the unit by removing everything that is nonlinear about it, and then ask it to solve inverse problems in a very old school way using dictionary learning and sparsity. And if you use this unit structured dictionary, uh, it turns out that you will do as well as the unit or better on a whole bunch of inverse problems that include computer tomography and, um, and MRI, for example. So, um, yeah. So it seems that the unit is doing something, something else. Now, going back to, to waves, um, you know, just a, a, a quick set of thought experiments. Are, are waves convolutional? And in the example that I've shown you uh, a few slides before, they were not, because the background wave speed is not homogeneous. And so, so the forward propagation is linear, because we were trying to solve the inverse source problem, but it's not convolutional. If we are trying to solve this inverse source type problem, so to derive the initial pressure, then for a constant background wave speed, the uh, problem will be linear and convolutional. Right? The background wave speed is varying, not constant. The problem will still be linear, but it stops being convolutional. However, it's barely non convolutional because we can hit it with an adjoint again and turn it into a convolutional problem. However, if C is unknown, then the problem is non linear and there's not even, I mean, adjoint is not defined. This doesn't make sense to talk about it. And and the most interesting kind of problem, medium recovery, then this is a completely nonlinear problem. Now, of course, when we're faced with nonlinear problems, we're linear. So this has been um, traditionally the method of choice. Uh, and uh, one way to, to linearize wave inversion uh, that, is, that is very well known is um, 
to assume that the true wave speed uh, consists of two parts. Uh, it consists of, of, a, of a known part C naught and of a perturbation that is in some sense small, delta C. And then, uh, you know, you can plug this, um, you can sort of, you know, calculate in a few lines that this gives you something that's called the Born approximation or, or the single scattering approximation. And using this approximation, you can actually linearize the, the inversion problem. Now, I'll do something similar, but not, not, not the same in the following sense. So I'll similarly assume that the background wave speed consists of, of two parts, but the perturbation doesn't have to be small in any conventional sense. So I'll assume that the part uh, C0 is smooth and that the part delta C contains discontinuities. So it could actually be pretty large, uh, but the important thing about it is that it contains discontinuities or maybe reflectors or calcifications or things like that. And the question will be how to recover those discontinuities. Very importantly, we will not assume that C0 is known. So we'll keep it unknown. We'll just benefit from this frame of mind, from this framework to think about things. So there are two things to recover. One is the smooth part, and then there are discontinuities that cause scattering. And the smooth part causes the bending of rays. Well, one way to, to show this is in this uh, set of frequency separation diagram. Um, so this separation is known in the literature as scale separation. You know, probably you've heard about it many times. And it somehow means that the medium consists of, you know, I can characterize the medium by this smooth part and the perturbation and the Fourier transform. So the spectral content of the two parts is, 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 uh, is well separated. So that's the idea. And then, uh, you know, I can, I can use geometric optics uh, to reason about this high frequency part, which is still in some sense regular. So one thing that I avoid by using geometric optics in this part is that, uh, you know, I don't have to deal with very fine discretizations uh, to resolve the full wave equation at, at, at high frequencies and the corresponding problems with, you know, loss that is very oscillatory. Okay, so this brings me to sort of the first definition of what we are really trying to do. And so we assume that we get some measurements, U, let's say a field seismogram or, or uh, recorded pulses, uh, echoes from, from, from tissues. And these measurements are related to the unknown V via some operator A sigma. Now V will correspond really to delta C, to the perturbation. That's what I'll be trying to image. And the measurements will be connected to V via this operator A sigma, which is a linear operator, but it depends on this smooth part, which I call here sigma, just to make it general. Um, and it depends on sigma in a nonlinear way. However, because we don't know sigma, we don't really know the operator A. We only know it up to a class. So we can characterize the class of operators it belongs to, but not A itself. Okay. And now with this idea that there are some high frequency things that we try to recover and that uh, the corresponding waves propagate uh, you know, over a smooth medium, um, I'd like to start building up a little bit intuition for, for wave imaging and intuition for wave imaging. So, um, you know, some of you or many of you are maybe familiar with it, but I, I think this is quite cute. So suppose that the problem that we're trying to solve is indeed um, the reverse time continuation problem that I already described. So we have this initial pressure. It propagates over some non-homogeneous background for a while to give some final pressure and we're trying to reverse it back. Now, instead of this complicated uh, setting, assume that the pressure is being generated by a simple point source. Well, then after some time, capital T, uh, the wave field will be supported in a sphere, uh, let's say if you're in 3D, uh, of radius T, essentially. And we're trying to recover from this final wave field the, the point source. What we can do is, you know, we can, we can zoom in on, on a part of this wavefront and, and we can sort of ask, you know, this little piece of wavefront where it came from. And since we assume that for the moment, the background is constant and known, then the set of points where this little piece of wavefront could have come from is again a circle. This narrows things down somewhat. So maybe now you could do this for many pieces of wavefront here and, and kind of do intersections or stuff like that. But this is not what I want. I want to change the question. I want to refine the question. 
And so here's how I want to refine it. I'm going to ask, hey, little piece of paper, where did you come from, given that you are traveling in the direction of the arrow? Now, if I have the direction of, of travel of this little piece of wavefront, then uh, this narrows it down completely. It could have only come from this one point. And so it seems that it's very natural in this wave imaging problems to think about localization in, in, in space and localization in direction. And this is something that uh, in signal processing, uh, we're very much used to do uh, with bases such as curvelets or, or shearlets, uh, more generally wave packets. And in fact, you can show that uh, this wave package representation of wave fields is, is in a certain sense, the best possible representation. So wave packets are literal directed oscillations. And, and here, the significance of it is that as they are propagating over this non-homogeneous background, wave packets remain wave packets. And so it makes sense to ask these questions. They remain localized, both in direction and in, 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 in space. Um, okay, and so, a simple intuition for wave imaging is, well, we just have to figure out how to route wave packets back where they came from. So let's say that you have you know, a medium, maybe an interior of a body or of a planet, and inside the medium, there are some waves. So here uh, we're showing just a couple of wave packets. And these wave packets are propagating over this background wave speed, and there is a recording surface. So as uh, you know, maybe you can put some sensors at the boundary of the medium. And as the wave packets, some of them, impinge on the recording surface, what you can record here is a sensor trace. So here, instead of X2, now we have time. But these sensor traces themselves, they look a lot like wave packets because as the wave packet passes the sensor line, it generates an imprint, which itself looks like a wave packet. So that's why it makes sense to decompose the measurements as well, not just the wave field, but also the measurements like sensor traces into wave packets. And the wave imaging task is to figure out where these wave packets came from so that we can route them back to the first approximation. Now, we don't have to wave our hands through this because there's actually a principled framework that embodies exactly this intuition. It's the framework of Fourier integral operators. The Fourier integral operators are oscillatory integrals that are in some sense significant generalization of convolution. You can see that they uh, act in, in this version, they act on the Fourier transform of the input, u, and they consist of an amplitude term and of the phase term that are important. So to develop some intuition, if the amplitude only depends on the frequency psi, but not on y, and the phase is the simple bilinear Fourier phase, then this just becomes a convolution or a filtering, uh, something that you're very familiar with. And it can model things like blurring, de-blurring, um, you know, whatever signal processing thing we want to do. If we let the amplitude term be more general, uh, then we get something that's called pseudo-differential operators. They model all sorts of things related to elliptic partial differential equations. But the most important thing happens when we let this phase be, be general. Then these operators become powerful. They can, they can start bending the domain. And not only can they bend it in the simple way that I'm showing here in the picture, they can actually bend the domain in a way that's directionally dependent. So for every directional component of the signal on the domain, they bend it in a different way. And so that's what I'll uh, discuss a little bit now. But before I do it, um, you know, FIOs are not something particularly exotic. We encounter them all the time. Uh, so the ordinary Radon transform is in fact an FIO. This can be written in, in the FIO form. Uh, so all these integral transforms that integrate something along some lines or curves are, are basically FIOs. Wave propagators are also FIOs. So if I, if I have a wave equation and some initial pressure, and I want to write down the operator that takes this initial pressure for some pressure at time t, this turns out to be the sum of two FIOs. But this is true for the case when the wave speed is constant, but as long as it is smooth, this also holds. So things that you're familiar with are in fact FIOs. And a whole bunch of other problems uh, that I'm not going to talk about here are modeled by FIOs, in particular things like photoacoustic tomography, uh, synthetic aperture radar, Doppler tomography. And the great thing is that FIOs model both the forward problem, but also the inverse in a certain sense. So, so they're you know, a very universal class of operators. Okay, so let's now try to connect FIOs with, um, the intuition that I described in the previous slides. 
the connection is the strongest in the phase of the FIO, which is the central part. So it turns out that for the phase of an FIO to be admissible, it has to be homogeneous in, uh, in Xi. And because it's homogeneous in Xi, its Taylor expansion has a particular form. So here we Taylor expand X about a direction nu. So nu is a unit vector in, in the Fourier domain, in frequency domain. And the Taylor expansion doesn't have a constant term because of homogeneity. And, um, and so what we get here is this linear term and then a second order term in higher order terms. So if we're now applying this FIO to something that's indeed supported close to this direction nu, then maybe we can get the sense of what the FIO is doing by replacing the complicated phase by only this linear term. Now let's do exactly that. And let's also assume that the amplitude here is, is, uh, is one. Then you can see that the action of the FIO can be approximated by a simple change of coordinates because this here is just the inverse Fourier transform of u hat nu, right? but not evaluated at y, rather evaluated at some other point, which is given by this, this formula, by this derivative. Okay. So it turns out that if I have a signal that's directionally filtered, then when I apply an FIO to it, to a course approximation, I'm just deforming this signal. Right? So we want to interpret this as wave propagation. So what we're doing is we're deforming the domain. So we're moving waves and wave fronts around. Right? This change of coordinate is in fact a diffeomorphism, meaning that it's smooth and smoothly invertible. And note that it's different for every direction. So this is exactly what we want to have. We want to be able for every, to, to say for every direction, uh, you know, in, in the wave from, in the in the waveform, to say where it came from. So we want to be able to route it independently. This is what's enabled here because this diffeomorphism depends on the direction that we develop the thing about. Now, this idea of localizing things in space and, and, and localizing things in direction is, is a familiar one in analysis. And in fact, it's, it's exactly the object of study of something that's called microlocal analysis. Uh, microlocal analysis is, is intimately related to FIOs. And um, it's really all about an object that's called the wavefront set. So what is the wavefront set? So microlocal analysts look at a function, but the only thing they want to know about is where is this function not smooth? So where does it have discontinuities, either in the function itself or the derivatives? And then define the wavefront set as a set of all points where the function is not smooth. But not only that, the wavefront set actually has the information about the direction of, of these singularities. So the wavefront is a set of all points where you have a singularity and the direction of the singularity. And so in microlocal analysis, then people, people study how different operators like the wave propagator or the random transform move those singularities about. And so we can do this for wave propagation. We can, of course, do it for the random transform and so on and so forth. Now, the central set of object there is something that's called canonical transformation, canonical relation. And we've already seen a part of this canonical relation in, sorry, in the diffeomorphism that I defined um, here, right? So we've seen that if we want to evaluate the output of an FIO at the point Y, then we have to look at the input at some other point, right? And the canonical relation is telling us exactly this. So point Y in the output is this point in the input, but it also gives us information about how the directions of these wave packets or things changes. And so wave-based imaging in this language is really figuring out how the wavefront sets move about. This has been used uh, already in the context of deep learning uh, quite effectively, um, not exactly, I would say, in imaging, but in, in, in the context of, of wavefront set in painting. Um, and the reference is here. OK, so this slowly starts suggesting that to work with FIOs, a good strategy might be to decompose the wave field, u, into the various directions and then examine how the FIO acts on these different directional components. Uh, now, the only question that remains is how, how to choose the directional components. And a hint comes from the second term in the Taylor expansion. And this hint is also very appealing from the signal processing point of view because it gives us, uh, we'll see, I mean, a basis that's very similar or the same as curvelets. Um, okay, so, so far we've seen how to account for this term via change of coordinate. Now, to account for this term, we have to do a little bit more work. Uh, typically, what you would like to do is you would like to separate variables, y from xi, in order to get an efficient uh, 
efficient implementation. But this is possible for things that are smooth. So if this object corresponding to this second, uh, second order term in a phase expansion was a nice object, then we could have a low rank expansion. So we could separate xi and y. Unfortunately, this term is oscillatory. And so something like this does not hold. However, this term is oscillatory globally, but if you localize it in the Fourier domain to a wedge of a very particular shape, then it becomes tame. Okay, so what is this particular shape? You want to partition the frequency space into regions, into wedges, whose width scales as the square root of their length. So this is exactly the scaling that we're familiar with from curvelets and shearlets. And the reason is that somehow there is a very fundamental deep reason why this scaling is, is a match made in heaven for waves. It's, I call it the Goldilocks scaling. And now if you localize this term on one of these uh, wedges, then it becomes tame and it admits uh, a low rank decomposition like this. Okay, so to localize the function onto wedges of this shape, we have to use filters that are somehow regular or smooth. Uh, and the inverse Fourier transform of these filters in the Fourier domain gives us uh, these little wave packets, essentially, that have localization in space, but also localization in direction. And uh, you know, they exactly correspond to familiar basis from, from signal processing. But in the context of waves, typically they're called um, wave packets. Okay, so then the idea is that I can take this term corresponding to the second order um, Taylor, uh, second order term in the phase expansion together with the amplitude, which is itself quite nice and smooth. Uh, it has to be so to be admissible. And we can apply this um, low rank expansion, okay? And the nice thing, I mean, the, the, the significance of this, this low rank expansion is that the parts corresponding to xi, so these thetas corresponding to xi, they give simple convolutions. Right. So because I separated y's from xi's, now the symbol or the amplitude of the FIO uh, only contains xi, the frequency. So I get convolutions which can be implemented efficiently in the frequency domain. And then I also get multiplications which are implemented efficiently in the space domain. And so that's, uh, that's how we can efficiently implement FIOs. But we don't care so much about efficiently implementing them. We actually care about um, building an architecture uh, for waves. And this is what I want to do next. So all this kind of story immediately sort of generates an architecture that we call the FIO net for obvious reasons. So it seems that a good strategy to work with waves is to take your measurement and then first decompose it into, into pieces that are localized in space and localized in direction. And this is achieved by the wave packet decomposition. So the first part of our architecture, the FIO net, is a fixed hard-coded wave packet decomposition. And the reason, of course, we could make this part trainable, but the reason we don't make it trainable is that there, there is something so fundamental in this connection that uh, you know, perhaps it's not necessary to be learned. Uh, and actually we tried learning it and uh, the thing uh, didn't want to train. So that's another practical reason. But we have to keep this interpretation for the rest of the architecture to make sense. We have to keep this interpretation of, um, of directions. And so out of this decomposition, this is like a filter bank of a whole bunch of these directional filters. We get out a bunch of channels corresponding to different boxes here in the frequency space. Then we apply the convolutional filters, the convolutional part, those thetas. Uh, and for that, we just use a convolutional network, which is good for processing things in place, like the unities. So to, to you know, denoise things, to deconvolve, do it in a fancy way, but it's good for sort of in-place processing of stuff. And so we're using this convolutional network to do exactly the kind of stuff that it is good at like shaping and, and, and sort of uh, sculpting of the wave packets. But the most important part of the network is this um, thing that we call the routing network. And this is really the part that tries to learn for each direction uh, of wave travel, how to transform it, how to, how to, where should we send these wave packets back? What is, what is the diffeomorphism? It learns a bank of diffeomorphisms for every channel of the wave packet transform. And in the end, we just sum everything back and uh, we get a result. 
uh, we can actually prove that this architecture approximates FIOs in a certain sense that is mathematically well-defined. But that's, again, almost besides the point, because our goal is not to approximate FIOs. Our goal is to build an architecture that is a general architecture for wave imaging by taking inspiration from FIOs. But we hope that this architecture, and I mean, we'll show it can do, can do more. Um, in particular, one thing that it can do is it can mix different channels because this convolutional network takes in all the different channels of the wave packet decomposition together. And that's something that FIOs typically don't do. They process different channels individually. Uh, just a short zoom on the routing network. So the routing network really is nothing but a machine learning implementation, a deep neural network that implements the canonical relation. So we've seen that Y in the output image corresponds to this diffeomorphism applied to Y in the input image. And the canonical relation also tells us how the directions change. Uh, the significance is that these wave packets travel along rays, bent rays. And so this is the wave packet in, uh, in the unknown object, generated by the unknown object that we're trying to image. And this is the wave packet that we can image. And they are related to the canonical relation that we are learning using a, a parametric neural network. And this is really, uh, I, I would say, the core part of the FIO net. Besides the architecture, another important question is that of the loss. So since we are now decomposing our, our measurements and the wave field into different directional components using this wave package transform, at some point we have to start comparing these band filtered images. But the trouble with comparing the, this, this set of band pass images is that they're oscillatory. And of course, if you try to use MSC or the L2 loss to compare these images, you, you get a very poor landscape to optimize over. So in this experiment, we take one of these uh, wave packet or curlet channels corresponding to a particular direction. And so we copy, we duplicate this image and we just slide one copy over the other and we, we look at the distance. And so you can see that the MSC is, is just horribly oscillatory. So this is of course something we know. And in fact, if you try training this network with MSC, the thing will fail. SSIM structural similarity index is it's a little bit better, but that's still, still not great. It still doesn't give us good gradients. And the one that works beautifully, of course, is uh, the optimal transport distance, in which we interpret these images as, as distributions, and we're trying to figure out how to sort of optimally um, transport mass from one to the other. This, of course, knows about the distance this metric knows about the distance in the base domain. And that's why it generates a loss that's just perfect. Right? That's uh, completely smooth and uh, that can be efficiently optimized. Now, this suggests that in order to train our network, we should use the optimal transport loss instead of MSC. However, I mean, this has been tried in the literature and it, it's sort of hard. It's not trivial because of the problems with you know, vanishing or exploding gradients. And uh, even with the various entropically smoothed versions of these things that are now available, it's, it's not trivial to make it work. However, <laughs> there is this, in my opinion, fantastic thing uh, that's been published recently, which is called the Wasserstein of Wasserstein loss for learning generative models. And as I'll now discuss, this doesn't only solve this issue of you know, loss being hard to optimize, but it actually solves another uh, fundamental issue um, yeah, that I'll, I'll discuss in a minute. So the idea here is that um, this, this type of loss is used to train generative models. So a priori, it's a loss to compare distributions of images, probability distributions, not images themselves, right? which is something you want to use when you train generative models, of course. And the definition is as usual. So the way to define a distance between two probability distributions, P0 and P1, is to look at the expectation of, of some distance between two images, X and Y, which come from a distribution, which are sampled from a distribution that couples P0 and P1. So these X and Y come from a distribution pi, who has, this has marginals P0 and P1, and taking the infimum over all possible couplings of P0 and P1, we get the Wasserstein distance. Now, one problem that remains, of course, is to choose how to measure the distance between two images, which is traditionally done using L2 distance. 
But now you can replace this uh, dx by another optimal transfer distance, which is what the authors of this paper suggest to do. And so if you do that, then you interpret images x and y as being probability distributions themselves with some caveats, and uh, you devise an optimal transportation plan for, for these images. And this gives you two great benefits. One is, of course, that you're using the correct, in a certain sense, correct distance to measure uh, how different images that are oscillatory or they have singularities are. Another benefit that you get is that you don't need paired data. And we can actually use this to chain a network that solves an inverse problem. So here's again the framework. So recall again that we're trying to image V here, which is related, which is sort of the part of the background wave speed, which contains these continuities. And it's related to the measurements through an operator, a forward operator, which itself is a linear operator, an FIO. But this operator depends on an unknown background, which we hope will get access to as part of, uh, as part of training. And so the learning setting is as follows. We assume that we have a set of, um, a set of uh, measurements that come from, let's say, a given, you know, a given experiment or a given geological region. And they come from some ground truth distribution of measurements by you. So we get samples that may look something like this. And we are also given a set of objects, a set of these singular high frequency wave speed perturbations. Now, the reason I put tildes there is that, first of all, they're not coupled to the use in any way. They might come from the same set of region or object, but they could also come from a completely different experiment as long as they contain sort of edges uh, in a way that is meaningful, they'll serve our purpose. And so these UNs are connected to some true VNs in some way, but not necessarily to these VN tildes. Right? So that's the setting. And so in order to learn an operator that solves the inverse problem, that, that inverts A sigma, we proceed as follows. We, we look at we're looking for an operator that takes the distribution of the measurements and then transforms it into the distribution of, uh, of objects that we have that's not necessarily paired with our measurements. Right? So we, we, apply, we apply our FIO net to the distribution of these measurements. And so the push forward of this distribution is hopefully something that has edges, that looks like a plausible biomedical image or like a plausible geological image. So we compare this to the distribution uh, you know, that we have access to of these plausible biomedical geological images. And we try to make these two distributions look the same. The degree of freedom that we have to optimize over are, of course, the parameters of the neural network. And so at a high level, the idea here is that we're looking for some operator such that when it takes all these wave packets and routes them back, to where they hopefully came from, these wave packets all have to neatly align along singularities such as edges. And the only way to make this happen is to learn, sort of infer the correct background wave speed or to learn the correct operator because we're operating in this constraint class. Now to actually make it happen, we split training in two, in two phases. And the reason we need to split training in two phases is that the unit is still a very powerful architecture. And so we wanna prevent the unit from sort of doing the work that we're hoping the routing network will do. And empirically this does happen. So we don't want the unit to overfit. So we first completely short circuit the unit and only do geometric training. So we only train the routing network and only try to learn the canonical relation. And only then after we learn, you know, settle on the canonical relation, the routing network, we kick in full training. Now, importantly, this part here, the geometric training is unsupervised. We only need the measurements and some distribution of these continuities to make it work, which is great. And in fact, implicitly, it's solving another inverse problem, right? So implicitly, the training here solves one inverse problem, which is to image um, or infer the smooth part of the background wave speed. And then we get an architecture that we can use to image the discontinuities. Okay, so 
yeah, I've been talking about all sorts of things, uh, intuitions and then FIOs and then also our architecture. So let's now see a few experiments to see how, how this uh, FIO net performs. And in particular, I'd like to focus on, 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 on such notions as inductive bias and out of distribution generalization, but also interpretability of this architecture uh, that I'll, I'll try to showcase. And um, I'll showcase the architecture of three different units problems, actually maybe four or, or maybe three, let's see. But, but yeah, actually I'll, I'll make it two because <laughs> we don't have enough time. So I'll just uh, dark this one out. So one inverse problem we've already seen, it's the reverse time continuation where um, we have some pressure that propagates over a background wave speed. We get a snapshot of the pressure inside the domain at time t and we want to infer the initial pressure. So reverse time continuation. Another one is the inverse source problem. So it's very similar. We have some pressure, it propagates over the domain for some time t, but we don't get a snapshot inside the domain. Rather, uh, we have a line of sensors here on top of the domain. And as the pressure impinges on this line of sensors, we measure sensor traces. So it's a harder problem because we only have boundary measurements. Okay. So we've already seen this uh, reverse time continuation early on. Now there's a little more context. And we've seen that the unit actually does pretty well. So the setting here is we train both architectures, the unit and the FIO net, only using these little rectangular initial pressures. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to test then how they perform on slight variations of this, of this input distribution. But the unit does extremely well. And you could wonder again, like why, why not just use the unit? If I know does, does equivalently well, like the differences in grayscale levels are, are not so important here. But now you can try again, you know, to do this, right? You can try to change the, uh, to test it on an image is slightly different from the one that it's in training and the unit completely falls apart. Well, completely, it's still impressively good <laughs> given that it's completely ill-suited for this problem, but the FIO net does much better. Right? So it recovers the shapes and, uh, and all of that. In fact, we can, we can do another experiment for, for reverse time continuation where we vary the number of training examples just to see how important it is to have the right inductive bias or to have the right sort of physics built into the architecture. So with a thousand training examples, um, the unit doesn't do so well within the training data set and the FIO net does a little bit better, but not, it's also not great. With 3000 training examples, both of them, both of them do pretty well. And with 30,000, uh, I guess, yeah. Again, yeah, the unit for some reason messes up here, but yeah, this is, this is uh, really not substantial. Now, you know, for fun, we can try to see what happens if we're trying to image initial pressure that looks like an edge detected face instead of these little things. And if you do that, well, then the unit completely falls apart with um, a thousand training samples. Whereas the FIO net starts doing something meaningful. Uh, as the number of training samples increases, the unit cannot make sense of this image, but the FIO net does a pretty good job. Although this is an image that's totally outside of the training distribution. Of course, we expect to see similar things in our experiments, but the important things that I think that I want to emphasize here is that the unit has, using this example, has about 10 times as many parameters as the FIO net. In fact, if you use the F, a unit that has as many parameters as our network has, then it's very hard to get it to do anything meaningful, right? So we can use a lean network and, and, and do much better. On the inverse source problem, again, like uh, the training set is the same, so I'm only showing out of distribution tests. Um, so now we measure sensor traces, the unit um, yeah, messes up again, whereas the FIO net, so this is a harder problem. The result is not as good, but the FIO net does this uh, much better than the unit. And uh, we can try this on, uh, on other examples. Okay. Um, I mean, the unit is still annoyingly good, right? It's not supposed to be able to solve this problem, <laughs> but the, the FIO, is, FIO net is much better. Like, one thing now that I want to emphasize is that not only is our architecture physics driven, but it's completely interpretable because now we can do something that's not possible with traditional physics driven architectures. We can go inside this architecture and pull out uh, different aspects of wave propagation. So for instance, uh, we can extract the diffeomorphisms that are associated with the different directions of wave propagation by looking into the routing network. 
And uh, the amazing thing is, you know, like for, for problems that involve full wave propagation, there are two directions of wave travel. So for every direction, we actually extract two diffeomorphisms automatically. Uh, in fact, because this network, the routing network is implemented uh, as an implicit network, we can, we can do this completely continuously. So we can, we can really make a video of these diffeomorphisms and get a sense of how the waves are propagating over this inhomogeneous background wave speed. And we can also pull out the actual background wave speed. Right? That's really the benefit of, of having this cartoonish idea about wave propagation, where uh, we really piece together an architecture that models how wave packets travel. Okay, and this is the last thing I want to quickly show. It's um, you know, we can have a lot of fun now with this routing network and, and this whole framework that we developed. So as I said before, wave packets are, are traveling along rays. They're being transported along rays. And, and this is characterized actually through a um, Hamiltonian flow, right? So we can write down the Hamiltonian for, for the wave equation for geometric optics. And these rays along which wave packets travel are then characterized by, by the corresponding Hamiltonian flow. And since this Hamiltonian flow depends on the wave speed, we can, we can directly go for the wave speed. We can try to directly infer it. Here's an example uh, where we do it in 3D. Uh, so this is not to image discontinuities now. This is to image the smooth background, right? Which is part of the thing, like the implicit thing that we get from training. So you could, uh, you know, concoct some sort of uh, a smooth wave speed in a, in a spherical uh, domain or a ball-shaped domain, which is a mixture of Gaussians. Uh, and then this shows one possible ray to this domain. And then you can employ this sort of uh, geometric training to reconstruct, to try and reconstruct this from, from different sensors that are placed on the surface here. And you can see that you not only reconstruct these continuities, but also get an accurate reconstruction of, uh, of the smooth part of this wave speed in 3D. Okay. And uh, now this brings me to my summary, my conclusion. Uh, so, which is that you know there's more one more than one way to skin the physics driven cat. Um, so there are of course good reasons to use the exact forward operator and uh, close it in a loop and optimize some energy. And if that works, that's maybe the best thing you can do. But you can be physics driven without explicitly using the operator by only modeling a class of operators, and you can you can make this completely completely interpretable. Uh, another meta message is that. This kind of ideas of directional propagation of singularities, which are big in analysis, have been somewhat undervalued in, in uh, maybe in Im imaging uh, or deep learning for imaging. Uh, and I think that's a pity because I think they can bring about a lot of improvement. That was shown by the paper from, from Gita Kutinak and Ozan and, and others that I cited uh, on one of the previous slides. And uh, I see here also an opportunity to you know, connect microlocal analysis with learning. And so you know, to generate new interesting questions, both in microlocal analysis, but also insights for how to do better deep learning for energy. Uh, okay. And with this, I'd like to thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, so I saw that there's already some questions. Um, so first, maybe uh, let me open the questions from the panel. Uh, are there questions for Ivan? Uh, I actually have two questions uh, for the slide number 27 for your uh, FIO net. Let me, let me go there. Okay. Yeah, so maybe you have already uh, mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so the first thing is for the FH theta H, uh, you use the convolutional networks, um, but it's since the input is from this wave packet decomposition, um, what is the motivation of using convolutional net instead of maybe more general uh, fully connected net? Mm, yeah, maybe I didn't make this connection with the previous slide strong enough. I was, I was rushing a bit. But the idea is that <laughs> if you look at this slow, lowering separated representation, right? So, so, oh, here I'm missing something actually. This is, it's, it's, it's good that you, <laughs> I'm missing a bad test photo. But, um, if you look at this lower separated representation, then for every sort of for every wedge, uh, you know, the adic parabolic wedge, you have to 
process it using some convolutions here. So this term here, this theta, is actually a convolution. Right? Mm -hmm. And then there are also some multiplications which I ignore because in experiments, they didn't bring about a lot of improvements. So if, if, you, if you think about what you have to do to each different uh, band pass channel, you, you first have to calculate this integral here. Right? But this integral involves, uh, I mean, it's essentially the inverse Fourier transform of a convolution between U, which is band pass filtered, which is what I forgot to do here, and theta. Right? And this then convolution is evaluated not at Y, but at this uh, deformed Y. Mm -hmm. So that's the motivation that actually we need convolutions. Mm -hmm. okay. Another sort of, uh, another answer that I, I could give is that since we don't know the forward operator, we can't apply the adjoint. So we can't get in this Radon framework where all the singularities remain in place. Um, so what we're doing so here using this routing is we're sort of moving the waves so that the unit doesn't have to move anything, right? So the, the stuff that remains for the unit is easy peasy, is the standard unit fare. <laughs> right? It's another more cartoonish <laughs> way to think about it. I see. Uh, okay, so actually my second question is also about the training of the routing network. You said you can, so in some sense you can pre-train it. You don't need to, um, so, so does it like with the same physical parameters, uh, that routing network can be pre-trained and you don't need to adjust it for other, uh, say, uh, patterns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can pre-train it. Um, that's, that's one way to see it, but, but we actually train it, you know, not, not in some, we actually train it end to end, except that we short circuit the unit, right? But yes, you can, you can pre-train it. And then, uh, I mean, you can say, well, I have, I have a geologic, it's like a region where the background waste bit, the smooth part is now part of this network. And then I can use it to image things like discontinuities or earthquakes or, uh, you know, like inverse source imaging and stuff like that. Um, but okay. yeah, I don't know. Does this answer the question? Oh, so I'm just saying that if you change some physical parameters, uh, let's say the density and other things, you need to kind of retrain this uh, whole uh, routing diffeomorphism network. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one interesting thing here is that you have, um, you know, if you just look at the the result without even training the unit, you just you just route the wave packets back. You do this like first zero order approximation kind of. Mm -hmm. um, it already gives you an image that that is meaningful, right? mm -hmm. and then uh, then full training gives you gives you a nice image, gives you brings out the edges and everything. But but so this routing somehow is uh, is the bulk is the bulk of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one interesting thing we found was also that it's not enough. You cannot start with a randomly initialized routing network. Uh, mm -hmm. For some reason, you know. Uh, the training fails. <laughs> so what we have to do is we, we pre-train the routing network for a constant wave speed. And then somehow this, this, this works for everything else. <laughs> but the random initialization does not work. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so um, I saw a question from the audience uh, from Varun. Um, uh, Varum, so do you want to uh, ask the question directly so I can I can allow you to speak? Let me see. How do I do this? Uh, okay, sorry about the hey, I, I have a question if I can ask, or maybe after the QA. It's Raja. Hey, oh, sure. Raja. Okay. Uh, I want to ask, so you said that uh, the FIO net can apply also to Radon transform because it's a type of uh, wave, uh, because the Radon can also be represented using the wave representation that you, that you pr presented, right? That's right, yeah. So I wonder how this compared to other networks that were specifically developed for the Radon transform. Well, that's it. <laughs> Actually, that's... that's... I didn't even think about it, but but we should we should actually try it for the radon transform. I and mean, the, the the reason, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I, I don't know. That's that's the first answer because we never tried. I, I would expect it to, to work well if properly trained. 
the, the thing is that, um, yeah, with the Radon transform, it's just really straight lines, I mean, by definition. And so you don't really need to learn anything. The diffeomorphisms are tr trivial and given analytically. And I mean, you can also calculate the adjoint. So the adjoint already does this, exactly this. So what the adjoint does is it actually brings the singularities back where they came from. And since we have this adjoint analytically, um, yeah, I wonder whether there is a compelling reason to even try the FIO net. Um, but it's an interesting sort of <laughs> thing to try. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, thank you. Because I, I wonder that if you can check to what network your case converged to, so maybe you can take another a network that was trained to Radon and then replace just this part, and then maybe you can get a straightforward improvement. But anyway, uh, I will yeah, let the other sense, ask the questions. Yeah, but in a sense, you know, what we're doing, um, you know, one, one way you can interpret, um, where is the architecture? Yeah, one way to interpret this routing is, is uh, computing the adjoint. Um, so to, to, to like morally, this is really like computing the adjoint. And so what we would expect to see if we apply this to the Radon transform would be that this learns, you know, sort of the propagation of singularities by the Radon transform. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so next, uh, yeah, I already allowed Ron to speak, so. Uh, yeah, uh, hi. It was a, it was a really uh, great talk. Uh, so I actually asked that question before the key parts of the uh, FIO net uh, were introduced, and so the question I asked was, uh, uh, if if you want to split uh, the variations in in the speed of speed of wave into uh, this uh, slow part and a fast oscillatory part, uh, like, is there is there a, a, a how do you decide the threshold for this uh, scale separation? Uh, I saw that from your talk, uh, one way to do it is by the first and the second orders of the of the phase of the FIO. But uh, are there potentially other, other, other ways to, to do that? Yeah, so actually the first and the, I mean, the thing with the like theory expansion is not really related to separating kind of discontinuities from, I mean, it, it has some relation, but it doesn't really do that. <laughs> Uh, and, and this here, I think, is, is sort of, uh, so, so this is something I learned from, from working with people in seismic imaging. This is a little bit of, uh, of a black magic. It's an assumption that appears to be, uh, that appears to hold in practice. And so, so you can always assume that you have this, this separation of scales, but it happens naturally. And, um, and in practice, if you have to do it by hand, then what people do is they just use some sort of low pass filtering to generate the smooth part uh, for the race. But, um, but in, so especially in seismic problems, this separation holds naturally. So I guess the question is what you're trying to image. If you're really trying to image the discontinuities, then it holds automatically because kind of the frequency support of the discontinuities is, in, is infinite. But if you're trying to image everything, not just the discontinuities like calcifications or edges, uh, then in the context of FIO net, I, like the answer that I would like to give is that you don't have to care about it. Because anyway, this, mm. this separation of scales is important if you want to do things analytically and justify the math. But if you just want to use this architecture, which uses these intuitions uh, to sort of implement the core, the bulk of wave propagation, then you don't care. You know, just check if it works. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if this is a satisfying answer, but I guess in some applications like seismic imaging, where you try to recover the infer interfaces, it's automatically satisfied. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, an another small follow-up question: uh, Is it possible to, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, specialize the FI unit case to 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 you know, actually the case where, uh, you know, that actually the case of geometric optics with multiple with multiple reflections, like for example, uh, non-liner sight imaging or something like that, where yeah. there is no bending, but there is sharp reflections. There are many reflections. Mm, yeah, so, so uh, 
Mm, yeah, that's, I, I guess that's something that we're trying to do, <laughs> that we would like to do. It's not obvious because this is, of course, yeah, it, it depends whether in this multiple scattering case, you really want to image every scatter or everything is unknown. When you say non-line of sight imaging, then if you have reflectors that are fixed, then there is no, there's no difficulty because you can characterize the phase of an FIO. Uh, so if you just not, not line of sight with a fixed reflector, it should be possible. Uh, if you're really trying to go full multiple scattering, then, then you have to work harder. Then just purely, you know, this FIO uh, intuition uh, is, is not enough. You have to, you have to go full nonlinear. <laughs> um, that said, we tried to use FIO net in, in cases where like, sort of the, the strict theory would fail. For example, where caustics develop, where you have rays that arrive at the same point at the same time. And uh, so the canonical relation becomes multivalued. It's not a function anymore. It's not a graph. And it works because, you know, the, the, the domain transformations that we learn are not necessarily diffeomorphisms. We're just training some neural network. It can learn any kind of domain transformation, uh, but we don't understand it. So it seems to work beyond what, you know, pure FIOs would give, but, but we don't understand yet uh, why or how. Okay, uh, thank you. I can't hear you, Jane. Uh, sorry, uh, our next question is from Frank Ibon. So he put the question in chat uh, so I allowed you to talk, Frank. Uh, so do you want to ask directly? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Ivan, I want to ask if the, the FIO net can be used for synthetic aperture radars. Mm, I, I, would, um, I would think that the answer is yes, because in synthetic, synthetic aperture radar, um, we, um, you, you know, so, so SAR can be modeled using an FIO. It's, it's one of the canonical examples that people use when they introduce FIOs for imaging. On the other hand, I wonder whether one has to, because uh, in SAR, things often propagate through, through the air. So somehow, although it is an FIO, a random transform is also an FIO, but you can characterize it precisely analytically. So whether or not you, you, you need to train a network, I mean, you, you can train a network, but not, not because it's an FIO net, right? So here, I would say the strength is when you don't know the forward operator. So there's a parameter that varies continuously in space, and you don't know it. That, that is the optimal use case. OK, thank you. It makes sense. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the following questions are from anonymous attendees. So I just uh, uh, phrased a question. So the question one is, would the performance of the FIO net be affected in any way if the directions uh, of the wave propagation were to be correct, uh, correlated in some way? I would say yes. It's an interesting question, let me think. I, I think the direction of propagation are always correlated in some way. Because first of all, the background waves, we assume that it's smooth. Um, and wave packets are generated using things like edges, like they're reflected of reflectors that, um, that have strong spatial structure. And so it is to be expected that <laughs> this will generate um, a wave field that does have strong correlations between directions. And so that's, OK, that's, but it's a nice way to phrase it. Uh, because that I think is an advantage. If I know if I will work better in this case. And the reason is that we use a convolutional neural network to process all the directions at the same time. So it can benefit from correlations between the different directions. This is actually something that the sort of canonical uh, analytic FIO implementation cannot do because it's processing every directional channel separately. So I would say yes, but I would say that in fact, it can use these correlations to produce better images. And I'll write it down because I, I, that's maybe the way I want to talk about things, <laughs> some later point. <laughs> okay. uh, and the follow-up question is, uh, question two is, would the convolution operation used uh, not affect recovery of some information 
at say the edges, high frequency regions of a picture you are trying to recover. Uh, recall that convolution is a form of low pass filtering. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, the answer is no. I mean, it's uh, right. So convolutional neural networks can be also used for super resolution. So deconvolution is also, uh, convolution is not necessarily a form of low pass filtering, it could be high pass filtering. <laughs> So formally, a deconvolution is, is a filtering uh, as well, right? And so, so, so this is actually what we want the neural network to do, uh, the CNN. We want it to, uh, to bring out the high frequencies, to sharpen the edges. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the, uh, the final, I think the final question is, uh, how do the boundary conditions affect the learning result? Um, that's, that's again an interesting question. Um, in, in all cases that we simulated, we assumed perfectly matched layers. So we, we didn't really bother thinking too much about the boundary conditions. Now, having boundary conditions doesn't really change much in the sense that uh, if you have reflections, you know, let's say in a box, uh, the resulting operator is still an FIO. And so, so I guess that should work. Um, but somehow to keep it simple uh, in the current sort of proof of concept version, we, we didn't bother. I don't think this should fundamentally affect the performance, but I don't know for a fact. Uh, so do you think it will affect your, let's say the routing network? Okay. Yeah, it will change the routing network. So the, the diffios will change. Uh, I call them diffios. I mean, the coordinate transformations will change. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there'll, there'll, there'll just be some other coordinate transformations. And so still wave packets, you know, or the main thing is that wave packets, when they reflect, they're still wave packets. So um, that's what you're trying to learn. Okay, uh, great. So I don't have any questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, so uh, let's thank Ivan again for a wonderful talk. Um, and if people are interested, they are, you can go to the YouTube to watch the video again. <laughs> and uh, so we have another, uh, so our next um, space webinar is in two weeks and please stay tuned or visit our website for the information. Uh, Yoran has a question or, oh, I didn't see. Uh, okay, uh, there's one more question from Yoran. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, I just didn't see it. Um, okay, let me. So, Yoram, I, I have uh, unmuted you, so. I just wanted to thank you for a wonderful talk. Oh, thanks, Yoram. A pleasure to hear from you. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Right. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'll see you guys in, in two weeks time.